so excited to be here. When Susan first said, how would you like to come and talk at one of my events? And oh, and Sharon Eubank will talk too. I was like, I, you know, have I died and gone to heaven? I just thought, wow, this is going to be my two, two of my favorite ladies. And uh, so I'm really thrilled to be here and really thrilled to be the warm-up act for Sister Sharon Eubank, right? <laughs> she is awesome. Uh, so um, I want to thank Susan. I want to thank the Utah Women's Leadership Program and all of your wonderful sponsors for, for this. And I know we're a little over time, so I'm going to take a little of it. Okay, very good. All right, so I'm here today as the academic part of, uh, of this kind of duet that we're speaking tonight. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the global situation of women and how it affects nations. Okay, I think that uh, as uh, we became more cognizant of the importance of human rights, women's rights were, were there, uh, but the idea that whether you gave women's rights or not, would actually help determine whether your nation was secure or not. I don't think that that was really something that most people were thinking about. Uh, and so uh, with uh, some new developments, such as the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security, we've been moving into an age where people are beginning to suspect that women are important to assuring the future of the nation. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit in an academic way about that, and then I'll turn it over to, um, to Sharon, who I think is going to ground us in uh, what's actually happening and what can be done as well. All right, so, okay, I'm going to brag that, um, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> is that this book is actually going to be released on International Women's Day, and it is, it is uh, kind of uh, our magnum opus. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. This book was a decade in the making, to be honest with you. And it, it shows. You can use it as a doorstop. It's 602 pages. <laughs> but it represents the culmination of everything that I've done as an academic for the last quarter century. Uh, and so, uh, I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version of this book, which is named The First Political Order, How Sex Shapes Governance and National Security Worldwide. Uh, and I was really happy to do it with Professor Donnelly Bowen uh, and uh, Professor Lynn Nielsen from BYU. And so it was a really nice collaborative event. Uh, and uh, I'm going to share the highlights with you. Okay. So I'm going to say something that feminist scholars have said for a long time, but I'm going to put some teeth into it. What I'm going to suggest to you is that the very first political order in any society is the sexual political order established between men and women. In fact, oftentimes when I teach my class, I tell my students, let's present, pretend that we're in a video game design class and you get to create a game for me. And I'm only going to give you a couple of parameters, all right? Your game has to have two sets of uh, players, roughly half and half. And unless they both cooperate, it's game over. And they say to me, well, that's not enough. I need to know more. And the questions they ask me, what they want to know more, are all questions that are political, deeply political in nature. Consider, okay, will those two groups stand before each other as equals or as superior and inferior? Will decisions for the group be made by one of those two groups or by both of those two groups? If those two groups disagree, will conflicts be resolved peacefully or by force and domination? And lastly, and if you've taken political science classes, uh, the piece de resistance is always how are resources distributed? You know, whatever is of value, whether it be land or children or wealth, are those distributed equally among those two groups? Or does one group have a preponderance of those resources? Okay. What we would like to suggest is that you could consider a continuum on each of those four dimensions. And you could place human societies somewhere along that. Maybe some societies have 
more of an emphasis on equality between men and women. Others have a very hierarchical conception. Okay? So as a social scientist, I can say, well, where along that continuum all right, um, do particular societies fall? And we will say that the character of that first order is going to deeply mold the resulting society and its institutions and its processes, political processes as well. So the first step we had to take in order to put some empirical teeth to this proposition that maybe women matter was to say, so where are we, where are we going to look to see whether women are empowered? And of course, the big three immediately came to mind. Female literacy, female labor force participation, and female representation in parliament. And then we thought to ourselves, you know, that's really not where we need to look. Let me tell you a story. Back when I was still at BYU, we actually hosted a contingent of women from uh, Afghanistan uh, who had been elected to the Loya Jirga, which is their parliament. Uh, and several of us were supposed to host them through the day. And I remember sitting in the sky room and I was supposed to interact with one particular really wonderful woman. And I was going gushing naively, you know, I said, oh, isn't it wonderful? Here you are, you're representing the future of Afghanistan. You've got a university education. You've been a mem elected a member of the Loya Jirga. The future is really bright for the women of Afghanistan. She said, hold on, Valerie. She said, you don't understand. I could go home today, and if my husband said, I divorce you three times, I'd be divorced. And I would not have custody of my children. And I would have nowhere to go and nowhere to live. And she said to me, even if I'm not divorced, I may have virtually no say in when my children are married or to whom they are married. So how empowered am I really? Valerie. And that was a real wake-up call for me. And I began to think, it's not literacy. Because, you know, one of the nations that has the highest literacy for women in the world is Saudi Arabia. It's not labor force participation, and it's not percentage of women in parliament, because I can tell you the nation that tops both of those indicators is Rwanda. All right, so there's something deeper. I want to dig down to that first political order. And so the questions I'm going to ask are inspired by what that Afghan member of parliament told me so long ago. How much say does a woman have about getting married? And how old is she when she is married? How much say does a woman have after she's married in the decisions that are made in her household? What types of property and inheritance do women have? Are there inequities in family law, such as this uh, young woman told me in terms of divorce and child custody? Is marriage patrilocal, where a bride goes and lives with her husband's family? Uh, are bride price or dowry paid for her? Right? Bride price is sort of like Johnny Lingo in the... <laughs> and dowry, of course, you know, is paid in the reverse direction, where the father of the bride has to pay the groom to take the burdensome girl off her hand. There's, uh, is polygyny or cousin marriage prevalent? Does society view domestic violence and femicide as normal, even expected, or maybe even obligatory in certain circumstances? And lastly, is rape treated as a property crime against the husband or father of the girl who's been raped, rather than as a crime against the girl herself? That's where I want to look to see the first political order. I want to see what's going on at that household level. And what uh, my co-authors and I have suggested is that this creates a syndrome. It creates a, a first political order that is like a straitjacket for women. High levels of domestic violence. Males control virtually all the resources. Patrilocal marriage. Son preference and devaluation of the lives of women. Low age of marriage for girls. Inequity in family law. Polygyny, bride price, sex ratio alteration. Uh, all of these things are like a vice and represents a straitjacket. Uh, it represents the worst part of the continuum um, in terms of the first political order. And what we want to suggest to you is that there is a price to be paid for structuring male-female relations in this way. 
This syndrome here is a monster of frightful mien that destroys and undermines nations and children and the future of societies. This syndrome is really a trap. Um, usually we see this kind of very regressive first political order um, when extended male kin groups, think tribes, think clans, are ascendant as the ultimate power source within a society. Interestingly, it is those very same countries that are racked with instability, violence, terror, corruption, and autocracy. But I would ask you, how could they not be? Because the first political order on which they are based is autocratic, corrupt, violent, terroristic, and unstable. You can't build atop that kind of edifice without reaping the consequences thereof. Furthermore, in addition to those kinds of characteristics, we also believe that repressing and subordinating women will undermine other dimensions of national security, such as health indicators, food security, economic performance, demography, and even environmental preservation. In other words, and remember this, what you do to your women, you do to your nation state. And I would like to name that one of the laws of social science. All right. <laughs> If we, if we actually operationalize these indicators, which means if we actually went out and collected data on that entire syndrome, on all those variables in that syndrome, we would map it like this, right? And I, I think this is not a surprise to you to find that there is kind of a belt of countries where women are seriously, egregiously subordinated at the household level. Uh, but there are many nations that are still only climbing out of it. Right? If you look at the, uh, the nations in yellow, such as uh, China, uh, Mexico, Brazil, and others, right? moving, trying to move beyond that syndrome uh, has been a, a real journey for these nations. So what I'd like to do now is give you a couple of examples. How is it possible that how you treat women right, is actually connected with things like instability and terror and so forth? Well, sometimes the links are really immediate and proximate, and you can see them very clearly. One example is bride price. Yeah, the eight cow business, right? So bride prices, uh, in fact, about 75% of the world's population lives in an area where that has either bride price or dowry. So it's actually a very common practice. Bride price, uh, and in fact, I don't know if any of you know, but the the, the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has actually come out and said that bride price is not good, not a good thing to be practiced, showing that religious organizations, too, have picked up on the link that I'm about to tell you about. Um, bride price tends to act as a regressive and universal flat tax on the subpopulation of young men. Except at the very elite levels, there's usually a going rate for a bride in these societies. And not unlike real estate prices in Utah County, <laughs> there is an inexorable sort of inflationary bubble type of, of uh, phenomenon that begins to set in, pushing bride price up and up and up and up and up. And sometimes that rise can be really swift and really dramatic. Uh, so for example, in northern Nigeria, over the course of a five-year period, uh, they saw a 500% rise in bride price. All right, so this can happen very suddenly, very inflationary. Now, oftentimes governments try to cap bride price, try to prevent bride price from rising, but uh, it's often very unsuccessful. They're unsuccessful. Surging bride prices also fuel a greater prevalence of polygyny, where men take more than one wife. Because as more and more men are priced out of the market, rich men can take additional wives. So the two things kind of go hand in hand. Now, remembering that these societies are based on a very, very androcentric, male-centric first political order, 
Um, this engenders a deep sense of grievance in the young men who have been priced out of that market. Okay? The only way that they can really truly become adult men in their society is to marry and to have sons of their own. But you've just priced them out of the market. So what happens? Well, not surprisingly, rebel groups and terror groups see this and say, we can solve your problem. Do you need money? Do you need bride price? Do you need a bride? If you join us, right, we will provide those for you. And that's exactly what we see. Uh, I've talked to you about um, northern Nigeria. Well, this is, of course, uh, the um, birthplace of Boko Haram. And I think you've seen in the news, right, with the Chibok girls and others, how girls are kidnapped. Uh, and Boko Haram openly uses bride price inflation as a recruiting strategy. The Western media has reported quite a bit on how wives are abducted, but what they don't tell you, what you have to actually go and read the Nigerian press to discover, is that in order to legitimize the marriage, the bride price has to be paid. So as they're kidnapping a girl, they'll leave a token amount of money on the floor as the bride price. Uh, one young lady to whom this happened said, in this crisis, these men can take a wife at no extra charge. Usually it is very expensive to take a wife, very hard to get married, but not now. Now this is not a phenomenon that is confined to northern Nigeria. We have case studies in places like South Sudan, Pakistan, Timor-Leste, and other places where we can actually show how rebel and terror groups have strengthened themselves because of bride price issues. And don't get me started on places like Iraq. I think you know that ISIS actually promised $15,000 in bride price to any foreign fighter who would come and fight for the caliphate. Okay? That would not be an attractive bargain if the pride bride price dynamics had not made it so. Now, in addition to those sort of very clear, obvious links, there are more long-term structural links as well, linking what you do to women to what happens to your nation. And a great example of this is the increasing masculinization of the world's population. Um, the most current figures I have from the UNFPA suggest that there's about 101.8 men per 100 women on the planet Earth. Now, that may, you may say, well, it's a little abnormal. No, no, this is huge. <laughs> this is actually really huge. Uh, it, it, the, the predicted overall sex ratio should be 98 men per 100 women because women tend to live longer than men. So what you're seeing going from 98 to 101.8 is that we, we literally have hundreds of millions of missing women. They should be here on the planet with us. And they're not. Well, what happened to them? Well, I think you know. Right, which is sex selective abortion and female infanticide. Also things such as very high maternal mortality rates, uh, high suicide rates for women in some of these very repressive countries. What is shocking to me as someone who's looked at this problem since the 90s is that in 1990 when I first started to look at this problem with Andrea Denbor of the University of Kent, we could only find five nations that had abnormal birth sex ratios and two of them were Hong Kong and Macau which sort of belonged to China anyway. In 2015, the 2020 censuses haven't come out yet, so I can't tell you what the number is now. But in 2015, when the interdecadal censuses came out, we were shocked to discover that there are now 19 nations that have very abnormal birth sex ratios favoring males. And they're not just surrounding China and India anymore. We've got Albania. Armenia, Azerbaijan, notice how they cross religions as well. China, Egypt, Fiji, Georgia, India, Kosovo, Kuwait, Lebanon, Montenegro, the Philippines, South Sudan, Sudan, Taiwan, Macedonia, Vanuatu, and Vietnam. In fact, Vietnam now boasts the most abnormal sex ratio in the world. It has out uh, surpassed China now in terms of the abnormality of its sex ratio, which is ironic because Vietnam is one of uh, the, the, the top uh, sources for brides for the marriage market 
in China. Okay? So they're sending brides out at the young adult ages, as well as culling girls from the birth population. It is a double whammy. Vietnam is hemorrhaging women. All right? And that is sort of an unseen uh, story uh, in the Southeast Asian region. It's also true that migration affects sex ratios. The first wave of migration is almost always men, in particular young men who can stand the journey. And in 2015, when the first great wave came into Europe from war-torn countries such as Syria and other places, um, one of the few countries to open their door and say, come, come, was Sweden. Uh, in addition, Sweden also said, if you're under age 18, we will never deport you for any reason. So as you can imagine, those who were turned away from other countries went to Sweden. And virtually all of these young men claimed to be 16 or 17, even though they were, many of them were not. And that means that in 2016, when Sweden um, calculated its sex ratio, they ended up with a worse sex ratio among 16 and 17 year olds than China had. Sweden had 123 young men for every 100 young women in that age cohort. China only had 117 young men for every 100 young women. Now, what are the ramifications of seriously altered sex ratios in favor of males? Well, the research has shown pretty unequivocally a rise in crime rates and political protest rates. Uh, and of course, bride prices have surged. For example, in China, which has a terrible marriage market squeeze, and is also a bride price practicing society, you now need 250,000 renminbi to marry, which is 13 years worth of average income. Crimes against women also rise. So lots of trafficking from the surrounding nations and even nations that you would not think of. For example, um, uh, two of my colleagues and I are looking at marriage market migration into China and believe it or not, it taps not just surrounding countries like Myanmar and Vietnam and Laos and North Korea. In fact, the top export from North Korea is actually young women across the border into China. But even Pakistan, okay? even Pakistan, Pakistani women are sold into China. Um, forced prostitution as well, in addition to sort of a, a chattel market for brides. And mobility restriction for women sets in. Uh, where women do not feel as safe in a highly masculinized society. You can even see this among the states of the United States. Some of you may know that some of our states are actually highly masculinized, such as Alaska and North Dakota, and crimes against women are much higher there as well. Uh, infectious disease spread, STDs, HIV, and perhaps even a talk for another time, an altered calculus of deterrence due to altered perception of the cost of attrition warfare. So, so there are some very deep trends, right, that begin to take place and destabilize your society as a result of preferring sons to daughters. Now, is there any statistical evidence? And that's why we had 602 pages. I don't know about the rest of you, but I am so tired of when I say, you know, women actually do matter to the fate of nations, and people say, come back when you've got some rigorous statistical evidence and not just anecdotes. So I got really tired of that. And in fact, I even created the Women's Stats Project to, uh, you know, get me over that hump. <laughs> Believe it or not, believe it or not, in 2014, the U.S. Department of Defense gave us over a million dollars to see if there was any statistical evidence that what we had been saying was correct. Can you believe that? I'm still in shock. <laughs> I'm still totally in shock. So I won't bore you, except those of you who are into any sort of data collection knows, know that what we undertook was just a gargantuan task. I mean, 
nobody has data on bride price. Nobody has data on patrilocal marriage. We had to go out and operationalize these variables ourselves. Uh, and so it took us years to do it. But we did it. We did it. And then we took on Professor Lynn Nielsen, a professor of statistics, uh, in order to see right, whether holding many other alternative explanations constant using the most rigorous standard of significance we could, 0.001, which means that there is less than one-tenth of one percent that we could have gotten these results by chance. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll pay you later. <laughs> Because again, I knew somebody would say, significant at the 0.01 level, that's just par for the course. I wasn't going to let them do that to us. So 0.001. So we looked at nine different dimensions of national security. We were, of course, very interested in political stability and governance and security and conflict. That's kind of my bailiwick. But we also were interested in economic performance. We were interested in if the society was a rentier society or not. Uh, health and well-being, demographic security, education, social progress. And my co-authors had to talk me into putting environmental protection in there, but I'm really glad we did so. Because they told me, they said, trust me, Valerie, what you do to Mother Earth is really contingent, really depends on what you do to women, because Mother Earth is seen as a woman is seen, and she'll be treated as women are treated. I yeah. hmm. thought that was very interesting. All right. Don't even bother to read this. <laughs> OK. And in fact, can you imagine how long it took me to type this all up? <laughs> we took 122 outcome variables. And again, all right, I was listening to the little voice that would say, you cherry picked those outcome variables, didn't you, Valerie? If you had used my variable instead of that variable, you wouldn't have found the same results. So I'm thinking, no way that's going to happen to us either. So we looked at 122 outcome variables, many of which were attempting to measure the same thing, so that we got various measurements of things like autocracy, various measurements of things like economic performance. What did we find? Well, I am so happy to tell you what we did find. I think you can see by my smile what we found. <laughs> All right. 22 measures of political instability and governance in 93.8% of the regression runs we did. Don't ask me to explain that right now, but if you want to talk afterward, I will. Okay, we found that this first political order syndrome was significant at the 0.001 level and either had the first largest or second largest effect size in the model, which meant that it was highly explanatory of those outcome indicators. 35 measures of conflict and instability, 75% of the model runs. 10 measures of terror, and I just did the proofs on this one today. This, this particular research is going out in a terrorism journal. 80% of model runs. 22 measures of economic performance, 62.5% of model runs. Public health, 70.8, right? The first caretakers are always the women unpaid nurses and caretakers to the elderly and the disabled and the sick. Right? So there's no you know, surprise here that how you treat women would affect your measures of public health. Environmental preservation, 85.7%. I'm glad they talked me into it. It is true. All right? You're going to treat Mother Earth like you treat your women. Demographic security, not surprisingly, 71.4%. Education, 60%. Social progress, 75%. Across all of those 122 variables, 71.3%. The syndrome was not only significant, what was the largest or second largest explanatory variable in the whole thing. So if you're not into regression results, let me give you some odds. Okay. So that syndrome scale is like a stepladder. And what you're seeing here on this slide is what, how the odds change as you move just one rung in the direction of subordinating your women. So it, one rung on the ladder, you've more than doubled your chance of being a fragile state. You've more than tripled your chance of having a government that is autocratic, less effective, and more corrupt. 
one and a half times the chance of being unstable and violent, 1.28 times the chance of experiencing terrorism, 1.4 times the chance of a country being poor and in economic decline, one and a half times the chance of having a low GDP per capita, one and a half times the chance of having low environmental quality, almost twice the chance of having a high fertility rate, pretty unsurprising. 1.83 times the chance of having a higher incidence of in preventable deaths. And 1.8 times the chance of scoring worse on the global hunger index. Why do we get these results? I think there's three primary reasons. We believe that women's disempowerment right there in their homes, right, contributes to instability, conflict, and insecurity in at least three ways. Number one, that home becomes a boot camp, if you will. There is no better training camp for political violence and instability than lived domestic terror perpetration, lived domestic corruption and exploitation, lived domestic autocracy, okay? When you train your men in these skills, don't be surprised if they use them outside the home as well. And studies have shown that the more gender unequal attitudes a person holds, the more likely they are to commit political violence. We've even seen some stunning research that looks at uh, mass killings in the United States. What's one of the greatest risk factors besides being male? <laughs> For being a mass murderer in the United States. Domestic violence perpetration. Okay, domestic violence perpetration. They've been trained in how functional and effective it is to use violence against others. Second, as we saw with abnormal sex ratios and bride price, <clears throat> subordinating women, suppressing women, oppressing them, also creates these chronic structural goads that destabilize your society. Inflationary bride price, prevalent polygyny, Sex ratio alteration, right? That's like pulling the asp right to your breast, right? That's embracing, if you will, instability, chronic, unsolvable instability into your society. And lastly, of course, when you disempower women, you mute their voices. The voices of the very people whose influence could profoundly challenge this logic of autocracy and terror and violence. So we think those are the ways, uh, the reasons why we are seeing such strong results. So what does this mean? As a, a person who studies international security, it means to me that Hillary Clinton was right when she said in 2012 on International Women's Day when she was Secretary of State, the subjugation of women is a threat to the common security of our world and to the national security of our country. When we think that we have put rigorous analytical teeth behind that statement, it is not just some sort of politically co correct fluff. It's not anecdotal, all right? This is really the truth. The character of male-female relations, I say, is the coal mine. Now, the reason I say it's the coal mine is that oftentimes someone will say, Professor Hudson, you don't understand, all right? Um, what's happening with women, that's just like the canary in the coal mine, all right? The, the real coal mine is that we lack democracy or there's resource scarcity or there's deep poverty, right? And I say, no, I think you've got that backward, okay? The coal mine is the character of male-female relations in your society. The canaries who are squawking and keeling over dead to try to tell you there's something wrong with your coal mine are poverty, ill health, conflict, terror, economic decline, demographic problems, environmental destruction. Those are the canaries. And the coal mine is your first political order. Thank you. <laughs> I 
I'm loving this audience, Sharon. I'm warming them up really well for you here. <laughs> now, of course, I'm a foreign policy person. That's what I do for a living. So permit me to bore you and tell you what I think would change about foreign policy if this was understood. So for example, I would say, what about situational awareness? If the US is not tracking what's going on with women, especially at the household level, how can it expect uh, to anticipate instability in other countries? If it's not tracking things like bride price, if it's not tracking polygyny, if it's not tracking sex ratios, and these other things that we've talked about, how can it hope to have an effective foreign policy? How will the US decide which subnational actors are most likely to bring stability in the long term? Unless you first look at those subnational actors and decide what each one wants to do with women. Let me give you an example. I believe it or not, several years ago, I got to have lunch with Gloria Steinem. How cool is that? <laughs> and um, she told this amazing anecdote, which we put in our book called The Hillary Doctrine. And she said this. She said that she was down in DC at the State Department at a State Department briefing uh, shortly after the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan. Uh, and one of the speakers, uh, who I think was actually the Secretary of State, came out and he was talking about how we were going to support the Mujahideen, how they were the freedom fighters standing up against the godless commies who had taken over the Afghan government. Uh, and she asked, she asked, so why are the, what are they so upset about? Well, the Soviets are insisting that all girls be educated. The Soviets are insisting that women have the right to vote. The Soviets are insisting that women can actually stand for political office. And she said, I don't understand. Aren't we backing the wrong side? And she said, my question fell into that awkward hush which is reserved for the ridiculous. <laughs> and she said, if I knew then what I know now about who those Mujahideen were and how they would morph into the Taliban, she said, I would have chained myself to the seat in that auditorium until my question was answered. She's right, right? The, the people that we backed did not bring peace to Afghanistan. They brought horror to Afghanistan. And how could you have predicted it? Because they brought horror to women first. Think about that. How will the US avoid the trap of peace negotiations where the rights of women are bargained away to make peace between warlords? If it doesn't understand, you're not going to get peace through warlords. You're going to get peace through empowering women and you cannot leave them out of the peace negotiations. How will the US track which of its own citizens are the greatest internal threat if domestic violence is not taken as a serious threat? If domestic violence is not viewed as domestic terror? <laughs> immigration. How will the US rationally approach immigration if it doesn't comprehend that the true clash of civilizations is not about religion, it's not about ethnicity, but it's about the subordination of women. I spent six months in Australia in 2017 um, at the Australian National University, and I was shocked to discover that in order to gain citizenship in Australia, you have to answer questions like, is it legal in Australia to do female genital cutting? Is it legal in Australia to beat your spouse? Is it legal in Australia to arrange a marriage for your child without their consent? I didn't understand that this was on their immigration checklist. And a lot of people poo-pooed it and said, well, they know what the answers are supposed to be. They're just going to lie. But that wasn't the point. According to the people that I spoke to uh, in the Australian parliament, it was to make sure that anyone who wanted to live in Australia on a permanent basis knew where Australia stood. And not only would they know where Australia stood, their spouse would know where Australia stood. Their children would know where Australia stood. Okay? That's something to keep in mind. 
How will the US know that ending child marriage worldwide would do more for world peace than almost any other investment? That's something to consider. Child marriage is just the hub of this immense cascading wheel of negative consequences for society that virtually condemns a nation to a poorer outcome for its children than it would ever have had otherwise. How will the US know when exporting democracy makes sense and when it doesn't? If you've got a first political order of autocracy and terror, and you try to veneer democracy over top of that, don't be surprised if you don't get democracy, but some sort of Frankenstein version of democracy that bears no real similarity to what we're really talking about here. I believe that one day the idea that foreign or national security policy could ignore the situation of women will be seen as laughably naive. Okay, that day is not here yet. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people who said, I just don't see this link. One of my colleagues right down the hall, I don't see the link. National security, that's when people are shooting at you. What do women have to do with that? Women are never going to shoot at you. <laughs> but I, you know, I think one day, one day, this will come. Now, Professor Madsen has, has encouraged me to think about, you know, how about closer to home? Well, in Utah, I believe that the Utah Women's Leadership Project has noted a stunning deficit of women's voices in the Utah legislature. All right, that's not good. That's not good. Uh, as her statistics have shown, it's the 11th highest state in the nation for forcible rape. How the heck did that happen? It has the largest gender pay gap in the nation, looking only at women working full time. Furthermore, and I, I call this shamelessly from what Professor Madsen has done, only 32% of managerial positions are held by women compared to 40% nationwide. On the bright side, 13th best in the country for maternal mortality. I will say to you, perhaps some of you saw my Deseret News op-ed, that the idea that we would decriminalize polygyny, given all that I've spent my life doing, is insanity. But that's for another day, too. <laughs> On the bright side, Utah has outlawed female genital cutting. <laughs> yes. Of course, it was in 2019, but you know, it's OK. Better late than never. Other statistics, you know, closer to your own family. Uh, if you look at all of the homicide victims in Utah in 2019, and if you look only at the women, you'll find that 67% of those victims were killed by an intimate partner, and in one case, by her own son. We have some stunning levels of violence within our homes. Should we talk child support? <laughs> um, over $212 million in child support payments were collected in just one year in 2016, and that was only a fraction of what was due. 40% of Utah's children now live in low-income families, and a lot of it has to do with lack of child support. And then in 2017, which is the latest that I could find figures for, 10,612 substantiated cases of child abuse which is higher than the national average. One source says eighth highest in the nation. Right, so there's some work to be done here with our first political order. So to sum up, and I think I'm actually on time. To sum up, if there's one takeaway that I want you to take away from this auditorium tonight, what you do to your women, you do to your family, you do to your community, you do to your nation and you do to your future. Thank you very much for allowing me to be with you tonight.